Hello and a warm welcome to this new feature on Kaya FM Biz with myself, Kukule Tukele. It's what we call Pivot Point. And many of you know the definition of a pivot is a turning point or a place at which an item oscillates. And that's exactly what we want to find out by speaking to captains of industry, members of the upper echelon society, as to what were the key pivot points in their life as well as in their entrepreneurial journeys. To start this off, we joined today by a very special guest, someone who has certainly spearheaded developments within the property space, the Chief Executive Officer of Robosa's Property Fund, listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, Sisa Ngebulana. So good to have you with us today, sir. Thank you, Gugu. Thanks for having me here. It is a different platform, and uh, as we joked off air, that uh, this time it's not about company results, but really looking at your entrepreneurial journey and uh, how you started out in the space of uh, property. But that wasn't always the case when you grew up in the Eastern Cape, just outside of Mtata, and your grandparents were actually quite influential. Your grandfather, an entrepreneur himself, and your grandmother really encouraging you to further your studies. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. So really, I think for me, uh, well, thanks for having me first. I think uh, it's, it's lovely to be here. For me, uh, I grew up in a family, you know, it, it's lovely that I grew up in an environment where in, in a village, you know, you've got space, and, and I think sometimes space allows you to think uh, without uh, realizing that, in fact, um, you know, uh, you, th there's confines in life and there's constraints uh, on, um, sometimes they say if you grow in a smaller place, mm. it does limit your thinking psychologically without realizing it. And I think that's played a long, uh, a big part of me. Um, even in Joburg, I live in a small holding area because I love space. Um, so growing up with my grandparents out in the village, uh, they had a uh, little uh, shop in the village, and you know I was behind the counter all my life, and uh, then they had some brick fields, and if I wasn't behind the counter, I was out of the brick fields. What that taught me is just a value of being resourceful, you know, not, not spending your time on things that don't progress you in life. Mm. Um, so that, that was quite important for me, and I've seen it play its part in my life uh, in, in a lot of things that I've done in my life. Did that have an influence, though, when you studied law? Yes. So, so effectively, uh, you know, I used to debate quite a lot, or in fact, argue with my grandmother quite a lot. Ah. And she said, you will make a, a great lawyer. I mean, I had very average metric results. Um, and I wasn't really looking forward to um, becoming an academic or, you know, um, getting academia to a level. Um, but my grandparents were uh, disciplinarians and uh, they believe in the value of education, which is, uh, has been quite important in my life. And um, they insisted I'll do law. And uh, What I did you want to study though, if you had your a choice and an option? Did you want to go a different route maybe, aside from law? You know, funny enough, um, we used to buy a lot of uh, quarry stone from a local quarry in, in Umtata. And I always had the dream of owning a quarry one day. Ah. So I put a business plan, funny enough, with Matric, and I used to go to, you know, I used to have this Bob T uh, account, and I used to go to the local bank manager, mm. um, putting one business plan after the other. And of course, he thought uh, I was just a dreamer. But it was quite interesting. I mean, I really believed that I could get to that point. Uh, so there was an aunt of mine who was also in business, who was a doctor, and we had some plans uh, where I would look after certain of her businesses in Butterworth, and I would do part-time studies in business and that sort of thing. And uh, my grandparents said none of that. Um, so, you know, my grandmother got me into university, um, up in f literally applied for me to get to university. Wow. And I found myself there doing law. And I suppose uh, what is the most important uh, part of this all was, you know, when, when we got to uh, the first day, they had to pay the fees and deposits and that sort of thing. And there was about five of us, because when we grew up, you know, I grew up with a lot of cousins, sometimes mm. I didn't even know how we related. As you know, in our families, if you're well-to-do, you look after the whole family. Precisely. My grandparents, that's really what they, uh, they, they had to do in their lives. So we grew up quite a lot of, you know, siblings and cousins and that sort of thing. So there was five of us who went to university at the same time. Mm. And she said to us, guys, I've saved for you for the last five years. Um, this is all I have, just to get to your registration it will cover you for the first six months uh, of university. And beyond that, if you don't do well, you know, it's really up to you. You may go through the first year, but it'll be the end of it. Sure. And, um, and that resonated with me. And I suppose it was one of those uh, pivotal points in your life where something sinks with you and you realize it's really in your hands. This person has sacrificed the last five years to save so much that they care so much about your future and where 
you know, what tomorrow would look like for you. And from that point in time, you know, for the first time in my life, I started putting a lot of hard hours to study. I'd come back from library at about 10 o'clock, go to the lecture rooms, come back at about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I still remember there was a pole, a light pole, which used to just switch off when I go past it. And I started to have a prayer next to that pole because I thought, geez, this is quite coincidental. Mm -hmm. And I'll just remember her words. And I'd really just, you know, and I knew at that point in time I wouldn't waste the time. And I wouldn't wa uh, want to waste her resources and the effort in life uh, for having put me through. And, uh, and for the first time, I had straight A's at university. I had 1B and in, in that June uh, that year. And I was able to carry on with Stunner Bank loans uh, beyond that, which was quite fantastic. It was. Um, so, yeah. Certainly seems like lessons that really stuck with you and actually shaped your thinking, how you approach life and even uh, the future objectives that you wanted to achieve. But let's fast track to you graduating. Yes. And I understand you did your articles for a brief time in Cape Town and then moved into an area with regard to uh, uh, property management. Uh, and I understand you owned a trucking business at the time. Um, so let me, let me touch on that quite quickly. So, you know, when, when I actually, when I left university, uh, I went to Marysburg. I had to do my LLB. I wanted to uh, get honours before I can do my articles. But Standard Bank wanted me to pay their loans. Yes. And they gave me a job to go so that I can pay the loans. But, you know, I had a bit of scholarship in Natal and I thought, you know, I really want to progress myself first before I could uh, go in, in a sort of work environment. So while I was at Natal, I had the pressure of paying back the student loans because Standard Bank wanted me to pay their loans. And I thought hard about it. And I thought, geez, actually I could maybe do something. And I um, started thinking about selling homes. So I registered as an estate agent. Uh, I, I wrote the board exams, I think they were in April of that year. And I sold homes with Reality L1. And, um, but, you know, the first few homes you don't sell and, you know, and a lot of attitudes because I was selling in a suburban area. Uh, you're Scottsville. young, you're black. Young, black, uh, and some, some of the white folks would come through the door, see a black guy sitting there and turn back and start their car and go. So it was quite a challenge, mm -hmm. um, things you had to go through. But over time, you, learn, you tend to realize why people are turned off by the home. So the tiling, the bathroom, and it's always the housewife or the kitchen and that sort of thing. So I started having uh, different uh, tiles and how I could, uh, there was a program uh, called Draw where I could show different tiles, how things could look like, how the roof could look like, how the boundary walls could be painted and that sort of thing. So I actually ended up selling most homes on the basis of what it could look like. And I negotiated the deal between the seller and the buyer. And, um, and then down the line, I got disappointed by a lot of builders. I ended up doing it myself. In fact, it was actually good for me because I actually ended up making a lot of money out of it. True. So I did a lot of renovations of homes on the back of that. And um, the following year, I was able to pay all my student loans. I, um, I bought my first BMW cash. Tell us about <laughs> that. That's six. what every young, so successful <laughs> young man wants to attain. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, those years, uh, I suppose even these days, you can say cars are expensive. But uh, uh, I thought that it was quite expensive. It was 32,000 rand brand new uh, back, back those years. Um, what kind of BM was it? Gusheshe? Yeah, ah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so yeah. So, uh, you know, it was quite, quite exciting uh, time of my life. You look back, and you know, you're able to turn something that's kind of adversity into something that really works for you. Uh, and sometimes, a lot of us we tend to give up at a point when we really shouldn't be giving up, mm. and uh, when things can turn around. And sometimes, you just have to have a little faith and you know, do something, uh, see through what you can do. But it wasn't always smooth sailing after that, right? Because it was also a substantial amount of debt that you incurred from the business True. itself, ran into some health issues, I understand. And then again, also quite a pivotal point where you need to start thinking uh, about your business strategy a lot differently. Yeah. So what then happens, I mean, I, I went to Cape Town, I, um, uh, primarily because I had very good marks at university, so the top 10s, you know, in our days, I used to put all of you guys yes. on the board, number one, number two, number <laughs> And Funny. you don't want to be at the bottom of the list right <laughs> no. there. No, <laughs> uh, 65 of us. So uh, luckily I was always in the top five and uh, they would uh, secure us appointments at the best law firms in the country. They'll fly you, they'll stay in hotels. So went to this law firm, they offered me a job straight away. And I thought, geez, actually quite nice of these guys. And I think as I landed in Durban, I just accepted the appointment. So I found myself in Cape Town for two years, did my articles there. Um, while I was doing my articles, I think I, I was getting paid about 600 grand. And I was sharing a flat and I just couldn't, I mean, I didn't have money for anything else. And when you do articles, you're just not allowed to do other things, you know? So all I could cover was my accommodation, my food, and the train ticket of 95 Rand. Couldn't even afford the insurance for the bloody car that was sitting in the basement of uh, sure. the uh, 
of the parking lot. So until the guys agreed that I could uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, I came with the idea because you're not allowed to work somewhere else. I came with the idea to uh, hire trailers and put a tow bar on my car. And the guys were happy with that. So I'd advertise towards the end of the month and um, I'd take, I'd hire two trailers and I'd uh, transport people from Sea Point to Green Point and that sort of thing. So that earned me quite a bit of money. But I found myself with in the trucking business because you know that led to me buying some trucks, mm. and I ended up uh, with uh, a lot of contracts on Hoss and Trail with Hoss and Trail trucks in Joburg. I came to Joburg, and uh, yeah, um, I think six months later, um, I wasn't paid for my trucks. Things were really bad in my life. I, uh, I had three blackouts. I had two operations. I took my pause. Took my appendix, and I got to a point where I had to decide, you know, um, to wrap up this business because it was going to kill me. It was mm. very clear. And uh, then I sold uh, old auction company, uh, Griffiths, uh, in the East Rand. I sold all my trucks. And I owed about 1.3 million rand to the bank at the time. And uh, when you do those kind of uh, auctions, it's subject to bank approval. I, I remember I sat down with Static and I said, guys, look, I'm going to make a plan to pay this money. Just I need three years. But I can't not have these trucks gone. You know, some of them went for bargain, literally 20% of my uh, original cost. Sure. And some of them, you know, better at 50% max. But I thought I had to make that decision because it was at a, at a point where I had to choose between my health uh, or my life, for that matter, mm. uh, and this. And luckily, Stanek agreed to it, and uh, yeah. So 30 months later, I paid off those loans, but I had to do something else. Called one of my ex-clients, uh, clients, ex -clients ESCOM uh, and APSA, and they both offered me a job. I took the ESCOM job at the time, uh, but I was getting paid 10,000 Rand, taking home 6,000 Rand. Um, and there was no way I could pay 1.3 million rand. Um, I could afford a bond of 230,000 rand, which I'd pay over 30 years. You know. So I had to do something about and it. And interest rates were quite high at that time, right? So, yeah, it was just before that. Okay. Um, so interest rates, yes, were still high, around the 12% and that sort of thing. So what then happened is that um, I started buying uh, empty parcels of land. I started out in Kalame Estate, buying uh, land. I still remember back then, land was about 21 to 23,000 rand. Why the close awesome relationship account. though for property, with property? I know uh, from an estate developer living in open spaces, has property just always been an innate uh, asset that you just uh, gravitate towards? I tell you what, when we used to deliver bricks when I was a youngster growing up, I used to spend a lot of time in, in building sites. So I learned plastering, I learned carpentry, I used to love carpentry and bricklaying. So um, so for me, it's something that's just naturally resonated with me. Um, and and what, tend, uh, what tended to happen uh, in the days, we used to um, have guys who go to Joburg um, in the mines uh, from the villages, from the far villages and that sort of thing. We used to drop them off in trucks in town. And they would have an amount of money and they would want to know what they can do for their family in building something. Uh. So I used to on the like typical matchbox calculate how much the foundations will cost, the walls, the roof, and that sort of thing, and what we can do. Because we had a general dealer that could supply the cement and sand and that sort of thing, and brick fills that could supply the bricks. And, and you know, we'd put the builders and we could do something for people. So it kind of resonated with me at a young age, and it was just a lot easier for me to get into that kind of space. Mm -hmm. And that led to you, uh, uh, again, as you said, opening up uh, and uh, purchasing these properties, selling them off again, uh, which led to the birth in the long term of Robosa's property fund. Yeah. No, interestingly, yeah. So uh, I bought uh, plots and I would build a home and I would sell it off. And then um, some years later in 98, crystals hiked the rates to about 26%. So I was just quite lucky. I, was, um, I, I just sold a few homes and I had, uh, I had access to cash and I was able to buy a lot of uh, spec home developers on the same street in Iron Crescent in Kalame Estate. I bought about six of those. And I made something out of it. And then I focused really on more upmarket estates. So I chose Danefer and Picanood was also starting at the time. Mm. And then I graduated into clusters in Hyde Park and Bryanston and, you know, that sort of thing. And then I lost it all. Um, uh, funny enough, uh, while I was doing this, so I was uh, at uh, ESCOM Legal and I specialized in Treasury. And um, I ended up uh, in the Treasury. I had a stint in the Armani markets and the capital markets as a trader. And then it got to a point where, and then I headed the structured finance, and then it, it got to a point where, you know, I used to meet guys in the market, and, uh, and I, I thought, you know, I could structure some of the deals. Some of the guys, uh, in fact, it was a function that one of the uh, companies, was a uh, century company at the time, listed company in the JSE. Mm -hmm. It had financial issues. Uh, it had been suspended from trading. Uh, Capital Coal was in trouble, one of the subsidiary companies. 
I took over the company, did the Section 311, recapitalized the balance sheet, uh, ended up with about 42% of the company uh, in private hands, uh, together with the banks owning the other 42% management uh, owning the balance. Um, but within eight months, you know, there was more trouble. Mm. Um, it became clear that, uh, so when I approached the banks, they said, look, unless you're really full-time in the company, um, we can't even listen to you. So again, uh, that was a quite a pivotal point in my life because I had to decide, do I carry on um, with employment? I've, I've just lost everything in this company. In fact, I'll lose more because at that point in time, I had to chip in every month to just keep things going. Or do I make the, co the call and get out of employment and focus on this? And I made the call, got out of employment, and I focused uh, in, in the company. But I couldn't save it. You know, I ended up... Um, having to pay the loans by selling equipment and that sort of thing. Uh, I just made it by the skin of my teeth to get out of the debt. Mm. And then I think what, highlight, what that highlighted to me was really just to focus on my core skill and what really resonated with me at best, which is property. Luckily I had a, a, um, a plot in Hyde Park which um, I had developed concepts and that sort of thing. So four clusters and um, cluster homes and then I uh, went to market, I was able to pre-sell about three of those. Uh, and mind you that here, after I wrapped up the company, I couldn't even pay schools for, uh, for school fees for my kids, and it was really tough. Sure. I don't know how I survived for eight months that year. But when I pre-sold about three of those homes, I was able to hustle for um, a bank of a draft with my bank manager at the time, on the back of the pre-sales and the potential profits which I got uh, breeding from and I was able to carry on. Mm -hmm. And from there, yeah, so I just focused on property. And um, from clusters, I then moved into buying CBD buildings when the big insurance companies and the banks were moving out of the CBDs. Yes. And then from there, I, I thought, you know, like I love challenge. Um, I've, I've, always, um, I've always lived through challenges effectively in life. And I came to appreciate challenge as a necessary part of living. So I thought, you know, um, now you have a building, you're renting the building. But really, what else is there? So I thought, greater challenge in the property space, shopping centers. I got to the space of regional shopping centers, not convenience and mm -hmm. neighborhoods and that sort of thing, where you have to do market research, site location is important, so ease of access and egress, and tenant mix is quite important to the success of it and that sort of thing. So my first center at Mdansani in uh, the Eastern Cape, I did about 40,000 square meters of uh, shopping center there, uh, and then followed by many others with And Hemingway's is really the, 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 the key crown in that, uh, or jewel rather, in that particular crown as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> talking Hemingway's. You know, I had, I think for the first time, I got into the big boy space where I, um, at that level of uh, size of shopping center, there's a handful that can be done, or that could be done in the country. In fact, since then, there's, uh, there's hardly uh, a dozen of those that's been done since. Mm. So when you identify an opportunity like that, the competition is tough, and it's the big boy we're competing against. I actually want to pick your brain on how easy it was at the time, because you're stepping into an industry where a lot of the leaders are white, older men uh, uh, and you stepping in as a newcomer you've got some background and skin in, skin in the game but when there aren't necessarily policies that are there to support you and enable your participation in the industry how do you prove your metal how did you you know overcome some of those uh, psychological challenges as well where you constantly a, it, have to it's prove yourself it's a hard fight it's it's you know you've got to you've got to have complete faith and you've got to be resilient um, you've got to have the perseverance for it uh, because it can hit you hard. Mm. I mean, some of my worst experiences when I did Hemingway's, which I didn't know. You know, sometimes if people were to tell you these things before you go through, you wouldn't do it, you know. Really? No, you wouldn't do it because you just think that's way too much for me. And, but you know, and, and, and that's a good thing about the life we live because only God knows. Mm. <laughs> and, um, but you look back, you're like, geez, these are necessary experiences in my life because you come across greater challenges and you're much more ready for them. So. For instance, just long story short, Hemingway's, um, I competed on the site with a uh, listed fund and a great uh, developer who does uh, big shopping centers. They'd just done another shopping center next to one of the casinos uh, with the Tsokosan group, but I was buying the land from Tsokosan group. So I competed to buy the land. So eventually they gave it to me. Uh, and the guys went to the market saying all sorts of things about you know, uh, how we got the land and that sort of thing, which really, I mean, it's a private, uh, deal between two companies, but what they didn't realize is that Tsokhsan was mostly looking at how you'll best manage for the next two years the road pollution and so that their customers are not inconvenienced. Okay. Turnover of the casino, um, 
impact, you know, are so great that you couldn't possibly compensate them with penalties they can impose on you. So I had to simulate the entire construction uh, process, how I'll clean up the streets, how the trucks will travel, how those trucks will be washed up, uh, and a whole range of things, how I'll re -relo relocate their existing parking to a temporary facility and shuttle their patrons, how I'll take them back into a building which is still under construction underneath and you know, that sort of thing. So it was quite important and, and I focused on that. And I think they were a bit complex in my competition at the time. Then when I got to market, uh, I realized there were far more other uh, schemes that are being proposed. Mm. And in fact, all the tenants that committed to the other schemes. But then, you know, uh, when I look deeper, I realized in fact, it's actually good for me because it's not like all the tenants are in one scheme. And there's all the big boys whose, name was, uh, whose names I won't mention, but you know, it's uh, big white capital mm. uh, behind. And, um, and I thought, geez, okay. But I knew that my location, you know, this kind of thing is, it, it's about location, location, location. Sure. I knew my location was the best. High visibility on the highway, ease of access and egress, uh, central to your uh, primary market and, th and that sort of thing. So I knew I couldn't get through to the property executives of these retailers. I directly went to the CEOs. Um, and I would take the CEOs, fly over, long story short, fly over into East London, fly them with a, um, a chopper over the uh, city mm -hmm. and point out my competition sites and point out my site. It was a no-brainer. My site was the best site. So within six weeks, they came to my site. Now I'd started negotiating with contractors. I, I approached the contractor who had uh, assisted me, uh, whose name I won't mention, to simulate the model uh, to uh, Tsokosan. And suddenly nobody wanted to build for me. It was a 1.2 billion rand contract, and it was quite strange. And I realized for the first time how serious um, this kind of market is and how uh, white capital or capital that's out there and vested interest could literally block you from mm. a lot of things. From a perception, talking badly about you, from, um, from, from just you know, the, the relationships they have, how they could block you. So two things I want to talk about. One, I couldn't get a construction company to build for me. First year guys, all of them refused, uh, citing all sorts of uh, flimsy uh, excuses. Two, uh, I couldn't get the second tier guys because they said, no, the stadiums are coming in two years. We're going to be building these stadiums and that sort of thing. And they're also the second tier guys are contracted to the big guys. I thought, geez, okay. And I remember my team had lost faith and they thought we must abandon. But the one thing which I knew is that number one, I got commitments even from CEOs of retailers. You have opening dates that are determined. If you don't open on the opening dates, uh, the penalties will sink you. Sure. Um, and these guys know that, you know. So um, I, I, I just simply realized I couldn't not do it. Um, and I sat there and I said, the only solution is to build your own, to build this thing yourself. And as a monster, I've only built cluster homes and that sort of thing. And this is a mall you're talking about? A massive mall. You know, it's a super regional mall. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna do it. And then I thought, if I have to do this, I have to pinch the best skills in the market. So I went back to the guys who had assisted me, the team that was behind, started with the MD, uh, and he'd been there for like 28 years, and he said, it's just impossible. Um, but then, you know, um, I'd like to think I'm a hustler, so I went, uh, I looked at every tactic you can do to lobby people, so I went, through to his wife who lived in the Val at the time. I went to his, uh, some of his cousins who were close with him, wow. his friends, um, and suddenly he was overwhelmed by people just, you know. I like uh, that, using his him. network to influence yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, within three weeks, uh, he agreed with me. The next challenge was for him to get his team. And um, I said, just apply a similar tactics. That's what we're gonna do because he's got the least experienced guy that was the FD. Um, and he had been there for 18 years. Sure. So, um, but long story short, 17 guys resigned the same day, came to join my team, and the MD of the company at the time, of the group, called me, he was very angry, but I said, look, what you've done to me, it's almost like you set my house alight with my kids inside. What did you expect me to do? I've got a big project, I've got to perform, and you know that I will never be able to do anything like this. I'll fall flat, I'll never rise again. Mm. Um, those, those retailers will never listen to me again if I, I couldn't deliver this. You know, uh, and if I couldn't deliver, I would go bankrupt in any event. So, you know, and he's, he said all sorts of things. I think I could sympathize with him at the time because uh, he was angry and all swear at me and then apologize. And, but the parting words were, look, we've got bigger wallets than you. We'll make sure that nobody, uh, your suppliers will not supply you. 
your subcontractors not work for you, and he tried. Deliberately you know? trying to stop you he and tried, get so you out of business. I mean, it's unbelievable. So we went on site, we had the programs, everything else. We couldn't get uh, shutter equipment, couldn't get the cranes. We had to go to Dubai, Austria to get those sort of things. Couldn't even get the local concrete supplied to me. I had to buy a stake in a local quarry owned by a local family to supply me with uh, stone in order to secure my stone before they could get there. I had to get batching plant equipment from Germany. I had a site uh, which, was, um, which was close by to the center to batch my own um, uh, concrete with, uh, with cement that I imported from Germany into the East London Harbour. And yeah, I'd batch my own, I had my own steel bending plant mm. because nobody would supply me with anything. Eventually, long story short, I delivered that mall 23 months later without a single hitch. And it's one of the best performing malls right now. Yeah, it's one of the uh, top malls in the country. So, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. I could have given up. Uh, but, at, you know, um, it's a long story. But there's nothing they didn't do. They didn't try. Mm. And the next uh, phase was getting all the other tenants. So all the big guys in my competition was going to all the tenants saying, if you commit to this guy, we'll throw you out of existing centers. I then realized that this very same guys had gone to the contractors saying, if you build for this guy, we'll never give you work. You know, forget about work from us. So that's the kind of industry, mm. and that's the kind of, you know, when you talk big business, that's what's involved. Do I blame them? I wouldn't do that sort of thing, you know. Yeah, uh, but ethics. perhaps when there's big interest being involved and people protecting their turfs, um, you know, it's a different story. I wouldn't draw conclusions. That, that takes real resilience. And I think we often take it for granted that um, as business leaders, you are human too. So you also get discouraged. You also experience failure. And you also feel uh, uh, disgruntled and angry too. Um, but as we try to, to wrap up the conversation, I want us to focus on two particular points. The fact that you've led Rebosis throughout all these challenges. It's one of the best performing uh, property funds listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. You're also the leader and founder of the Billion Group, also planning its own listing and doing phenomenal things with new developments across the country. But I also want to talk about your leadership skills and what you hope to impart to your children, given that they're also young, black South Africans who live in this world where there are several challenges uh, and the landscape is also quite challenging. What pivotal lessons do you hope to impart not only to the people that you work with, but more importantly to the young men that you're raising who are your sons? Well, um, I think Google, what I can say is that, you know, challenge is necessary in this life. Uh, you've just got to understand that you will never grow without challenge. So be ready for challenge. That's very important. Seek challenge. You know, and get used to it at a young age. Um, you know, because there'll come a time in your life when you can't face certain challenges because it's just too late to associate yourself with challenge. If you learn to be resilient at a young age and you grow that resilience with bigger challenges in life, you're far more ready, uh, ready at a later stage in life. Two, I'd like to encourage youngsters to focus on hard work. The value of hard work and excellence and excelling in everything that you do in life. You never know what may come tomorrow. It opens room to amazing things. Um, I know I excelled um, when I started university. That opened you know, doors to things I never dreamed of in my life. My experience in running a listed company, I listed Rebosis about six years ago. Mm. Um, we listed that portfolio, uh, you know, it was about three billion. We now have got about 21 billion uh, portfolio. The market cap was about 1.6 billion. Uh, we now about 8.5 billion, uh, moving to about um, by the end of April. Uh, there's another company, uh, Ascension, just taken over with the A units. We moved to about just shy of 11 billion. Um, I had a big related party transaction last year where I was disposing of two of my uh, latest shopping centers from Billion, uh, Forest Hill City on the N14 here in uh, Johannesburg, which I developed, and another one, a big super regional in PE called Bay West. Um, so that transaction took quite a toll on me uh, last year, being a related part transaction viewed with suspicion. Also jealousy in the market because mm. you're really breaking with the mold of white capital and, um, and, and vested interest. Is in that, that still space. a challenge in the industry and it's in the economy overall? Challenge. Transformation? Effective and efficient challenge. transformation? It is a massive challenge. It's unfortunate. It's there. It's a reality of our lives. I face it every day of my life. And you know the sad part is that they, the listed space is driven by perception. Mm. So what, the, uh, what happens is that the guys literally go and badmouth each other. Well, more so with emerging companies like us. They deliberately go to even fund managers who are black fund managers. And now you've, you know, you've, got, you've got more hurdles to deal with you know, from your own. 
and then let alone the market out there. So yeah. I mean, it's a hard life, you know, uh, and I've faced that all my life in the listed space. Uh, and last year's transaction was just a pinnacle of that, um, where anything that could possibly be criticized on a transaction was criticized. But in the end, you know, I got all shareholders on my side. It brought me closer to the universe of the shareholders that, that, that in the end supported us. And we had 88% uh, voting for the transaction. But the lobbying that had to happen and the demonstration of every little number that had to go into the numbers was just mind boggling, sleepless nights. Uh, I remember I was dizzy for two months and you know, it was just unbelievable what, what really happens. And you're dealing with perceptions of people who make it their aim and their goal on a daily basis to go and talk this down mm. to your investors. And these are people who are just competition out there. Um, that's just the, so it, just be ready for this. That's just what it is. You're gonna get these challenges. It is not an easy, uh, remember you're inspiring uh, many others. And, and I think if you sit on the other side and you realize that somebody like this is inspiring so many others, you've got to stop them before they inspire many others. Because the reality is we're known for BE, we're known for government tenders, we get uh, smeared with corruption and that sort of thing. So, so it's, it's in somebody's interest to keep us there, right? Uh, and not, and not um, let people realize that we're just equal. Mm. That we can do these things equally. Grow the pie instead of trying to hog on to yeah, the little bit that you have. That, that we'll be just equally capable. It doesn't matter where you're born, where you are today. Um, you're just equally capable and you can do it. Uh, so for me, what I'd I want to leave with youngsters, just excel in everything you do in life. Keep doing it right and keep excelling and keep, keep the focus. You know, don't try and do too many things at the same time. If you're still at school, at university, excel in what you do, mm. you know. Uh, if, if you're in an employment environment, even if you're not getting paid for something, just excel. Put those hours, those hard hours. It will lead you to amazing possibilities in life. Sisa, thank you so much for your time today. Despite the challenges that you've been through, you've certainly uh, risen to the top. You were trailblazer, well-respected, and, of course, inspiring many individuals out there and fellow Afropolitans. Thank you so much for your time today. That is the chief executive of Brabosa's Property Fund, as well as chairman and founder of the Billion Group, Sisa Ngebulani.